Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. This is with video 7 in my short course on points of topology. And in this video, I want to talk about the notion of path connectedness, which shows a different way of looking at the notion of connectedness. Okay, so let's uh, suppose here x is a topological space and let's motivate what this definition involves, okay? So to be connected, one way to think of it is that if you're given any two points in that space like x and y here, you can actually connect them with some sort of a path. So like this. Okay, so I want to make this definition rigorous that works in any topological space. How do I do that? We're going to say x is path connected if given any two points x and y we can make a path like this so what is a path like that well topologically this looks like a uh, closed interval from 0 to 1 so what we want is some continuous function f from 0 to 1 mapping to x such that well it begins at x so that means f of 0 is at x and it ends at y which means f of 1 is equal to y okay so if this hold for any pair of points x and y you can find this path this continuous function here then we say this x is path connected okay so let's have a look at a simple example suppose you're looking at epsilon balls inside euclidean space okay so here if you pick any two points okay to show that this is path connected we have to show that there is a path from one to the other okay and that's quite easy to do because in this case the epsilon ball is convex so in fact if you draw the straight line in here okay that joins them this will lie inside this epsilon ball and hence uh, you can construct a continuous function which is an affine linear function such that f of 0 is at one point and f of 1 is at the other point point. and that way we can show that any epsilon ball in Euclidean space is indeed path connected okay so the natural question now is how are the notions of path connectedness and connectedness relate to each other and this proposition one tells us one implication which is rather nice okay so if you have a topological space x which is path connected then immediately it will be connected as well and the proof of this is rather simple okay so what we'll do is we'll prove the contrapositive we'll show that if x is disconnected then x is not path connected so what does it mean to be x to be disconnected which we'll suppose here that means that we can express it as a disjoint union of non-empty open sets okay so suppose it's v1 disjoint union v2 like here v1 disjoint union v2 and the v1 v2 they're both open and they're also uh, non-empty okay so we want to show it's not path connected so i need to find two points inside this x such that i can't construct this path from one to the other okay so i can't find this continuous function so i hope you can guess where i pick the points what i'll do is i'll pick one point to be inside v1 and the other point to be inside v2 and pictorially you can see that you can't really try to construct a path from x1 to x2 okay so here's x1 here's x2 and pictorially that makes sense okay so we want to make this a proof now and the proof is quite simple uh, we'll do it by contradiction. So once we show that we can't uh, construct such a continuous function, then we'll show that this is not path connected. So we're done. So let's try to show that we can't construct a continuous function f from 0, 1 to x, uh, which gives you a path so that f of 0 equals x1. So it starts at x1 and ends at x2. So f of 1 equals x2. Okay. So let's suppose you can. Okay. So su suppose there is a continuous function with this property here. Then we want to derive a contradiction. And the contradiction we'll derive is to the fact that we've seen in the previous video that the closed interval, in fact all intervals inside R, are connected. So in particular the closed interval 0 to 1 is connected. Okay, so you have a continuous map f of 0, 1 into this bit here, which we say is into x. What we can do is that we've expressed this x as a disjoint union of these two open sets. Now you can use that function f to pull it back to 0, 1. And then we'll see that 0, 1 now is the inverse um, image of uh, v1 disjoint union v2. So we can also write this as the disjoint union of f inverse of v1 uh, with f inverse of v2. Now if f is continuous, these two are open. So basically we've expressed this connected set here as a disjoint union of open sets. And the other thing we know about these two open sets is, of course, f inverse of v1, by the way we constructed it, it contains uh, 
x1 here, okay? Because x1, when you map it, 0, when you map it, gives it to x1, which is inside v1. And similarly, f inverse of v2 is also non-empty because it contains x2. So we've expressed 0, 1 as a disjoint union of non-empty open sets, and that gives you the contradiction to the connectedness of 0, 1, and hence it shows that such a path like this, which is connecting x1 to x2, cannot exist. Okay, And that completes the proof of this proposition here. Okay, so the next thing that I want to do is I want to talk about the reverse uh, implication, but to do so I need to introduce a very, very important new notion, and that is the notion of path components. Okay, And the way we'll do that is we're going to consider a relation on our topological uh, space X, Okay, and it's motivated by this definition here. Okay, so what's the relation on x? Okay, so when do we say x is related to y? We say x is related to y if we can draw a path from one, uh, from x to y, like this. Okay, so um, we'll say x is related to y if, and the terminology is x and y are path connected. Okay, and in what sense are they path connected? What does that mean? It just means there is this continuous function f from the closed interval 0, 1 to x, such that the uh, path starts at x, so f of 0 equals x, and it ends at y, f of 1 equals y. Okay, so this is a relation that we have here. That's a part of the definition in this statement here. And what's the proposition? The proposition is that this relation is actually an equivalence relation. So once we have an equivalence relation, of course, we can talk about equivalence classes and partition the set. Okay, and those equivalence classes we call path components. Okay, so this uh, Proposition, so the proposition part is to show it's an equivalence relation is quite easy to prove and so let me do that quickly for you right now Okay, so to check that it's an equivalence relation you just need to check reflexivity symmetry and also transitivity Okay, so we want to show that uh, x is connected to itself. Uh, that's reflexivity. Okay, so we need a continuous function from, uh, f from 0 1 to x Such that it starts at x f of 0 equals x and f of 1 equals what x is related to x So you want this f of 1 to be x as well so the obvious thing to do is to just look at the constant path at x. You send the whole of this interval 0, 1 to x. Okay? And it's quite easy to show that um, this is a continuous function. If you look at inverse images of open sets, either the open set contains x, and the inverse image is the whole of this 0, 1, so that's an open set because it's, this is a topological space, so the whole set is an open set. Or you're looking at the inverse image of an open set which doesn't contain the x, in which case with this constant map to x, of course the inverse image of that set is the empty set, and the empty set is always open. Okay? So the continuous map, the constant map is always a continuous map, and uh, this one shows that uh, you have reflexivity of this relation. So the next thing is uh, symmetry. So suppose x is related to y. So that means you can draw a path like this. Okay, there's a continuous function such that f, such that f of 0 equals x, f of 1 equals y. And now we want to show that y is related to x. So now we want a continuous function, uh, a path, but one that starts from y and ends up at x. So we basically just travel along this path in the reverse direction and we're done. Okay? So basically, instead of looking f of x, now you look at f of, um, or f of the variable here t, you look at f of 1 minus t instead. Okay? So the, the next thing we need to check is transitivity. So suppose x is related to y, so there's a path like this which is continuous, and then y is related to z, so there's a path like this. Okay, We need to show that there's a path from x to z, so x is related to z. And I hope you can see pictorially this is true, you just compose the paths. So really these paths are trajectories, okay, because um, it's a function of 0 to 1, so we would say where it starts, where it ends, and the speed at which we traverse along the path. So if you go along this path from x to y at double the speed of the, the one here, and then continue with double speed of the path from y to z, you'll get a continuous function from 0 to 1, which starts at x and lands at z, and that shows that x is related to z. Okay, and that shows that this is indeed an equivalence relation, so you can talk about equivalence classes, which we call path components. Okay, so this is the example which will actually show that the reverse implication here doesn't hold. Okay, so this is a very interesting example, and it goes by the name of the swine curve, or also the topologist sine curve. Okay, so what does this involve? So this is going to be some subset of R2. 
okay? So it has it's a it has its Euclidean topology, okay? So it's going to be the disjoint union of two things, okay? The first one is just uh, the x values are zero cross the closed interval from minus one up to one. So it's this black bit here. Uh, uh, so you've got x equals zero, and it goes y equals minus one all the way up to one. Okay, that's the first part of it. The second part of it is the graph of this curve y equals sine of one on x for x positive. Okay, so let's have a little think about this. So the sine function, the graph of that is easy enough. It's just periodic oscillations, okay? But what happens if instead of inputting x, you input 1 on x, okay? So of course, the inputs, what happens? The inputs for x equals 1 up to infinity, now they get inverted. They get squashed up into the inputs from 0 to 1. And vice versa, what was the inputs from 0 to 1 are now the inputs from 1 up to infinity. So when we do this, all the oscillations that we had, infinitely many going off there, when you look in this graph here, they'll get bunched up inside the small interval here. So if you think for a moment what it looks like, it's actually quite simple what it is, okay? You come in with those oscillations, okay, I'll draw like this, oscillations like this, and then they'll get closer and closer together. And in fact, they will approach every single point from zero, minus one up to one. Okay, so this is a rather interesting example, okay, but it's quite uh, a simple function that you might have seen in your calculus class, okay. So you want the union of this uh, interval here, okay, and also this curve here. Now, of course, it's quite easy to see that um, this curve here, this part, this graph here is homeomorphic to, of the interval from zero up to infinity, okay, so that's an open interval. Okay, and uh, of course that's going to be path connected. Okay, so you can take any two points here and you can join them up with a path. Okay, so basically if you have a point here, point here, you just travel along, go up and down, and you'll get a, a path joining those two. Similarly, this is an interval and it's path connected. Okay, it's an epsilon ball, it's a one ball, basically about zero. So this is path connected. However, if you pick a point here, even though this graph gets arbitrarily close to this point, you can't make a continuous function from a point here to a point on this graph of y cosine of 1 on x. Okay? So, all the points in this interval, they're path connected to each other. So, this is one path component. And all the points on this are, one, are in one path component because they're all path connected. But you can't path connect a point on this interval with one here. Okay? So, that tells you that these are two separate path components, okay? So this uh, rather interesting space here has two path components, this interval and this curve here. But the funny thing about this is that, well, let's tr try to see whether it's connected or not. If you want to show that it's connected, well, you need an open... Uh, to show that it's disconnected, you need to show that there are disjoint open sets, one covering this bit here and one covering this bit here, okay? And of course, when you look at it, you'll see that you can't do that, okay? Any open set which contains this will automatically have to contain some of this graph of y cosine of 1x. So actually, you can't disconnect this space, okay? Even though it has two path components, you can't disconnect this space, okay? So this is a very interesting example. And then you might ask, well, that means that path connectedness here, okay? And implies x is connected. So this is strictly stronger, and you might ask, how much stronger is this notion? And that's what we want to answer next. To further study the notion of path connectedness, we need its local version. So the definition of locally path connected. Okay, so the definition is given here. So when do we say that a topological space X is locally path connected? Okay, we do it under the following circumstance, okay? So what we'll do is we're gonna look at each open neighborhood V of some point x inside that space. Okay, the condition we want to have hold is the following. We want to say that given an open neighborhood of such a point x, there exists a neighborhood n of this x, so maybe something like this here, a neighborhood like that, such that every point in this neighborhood, so anything like this, is path connected to this x via some path in V. It's path connected in V to X. So you can draw a path like this. Okay. 
so there exists this open label to n, such at every point y inside this n, you can path connect to x, and that path has to be inside v, look at this open set. And if that works, then we say this topological space is locally path connected. Okay, so let's give a simple example, because this is a little bit of a strange definition here. Okay, so any open subset of Euclidean space is automatically locally path connected. And why is that true? Okay, so suppose we have an open set, maybe you envision it like this. So it's this big blob here, union this blob here and this blob here. And let's pick some open uh, neighborhood of a point. So you've got a point here and some open neighborhood V like that. We want to find this neighborhood N, which allows you to path connect inside this V to this point here. And the key point here is that, well, this is open, right? So this is an open subset of this open subset. So of course, in particular, it itself is open inside Rn. Okay, so this V is open inside Rn. So you can find some epsilon ball around this, which lies completely inside this V. So you have some, this epsilon ball about that. And of course, this epsilon ball is path connected. So any point can be connected to each other inside this ball, and in particular to that one that you picked. Okay, so this is a neighborhood, this epsilon ball is a neighborhood which satisfies the condition and you can do this for any subset V um, which is an open neighborhood of any point inside this open subset of Euclidean space. Okay, so it's a bit of a funny definition but let me tell you a very very interesting uh, consequence of this uh, hypothesis of being locally path connected. Okay, If X is a locally path connected space then you can say something about its path components. All the path components are in fact open. Okay, so let's see why that's true. I'll, I'll explain, or at least give you the reason why it's true. So uh, let's pick a path component and show that it's open. So let's suppose we let uh, Z uh, with this brackets around it, this equivalence class be the path component containing Z. Okay, and let's suppose we pick an element inside here, X, inside this path component. Okay, to show that it, it, this is path component is actually open, all we need to do is to find some open neighborhood of x, okay, open neighborhood n of x, which is completely contained inside this uh, path component. Because then, uh, that will show immediately that this is indeed open, because taking the union of all these open neighborhoods, of course, will give you every element of this path component. But of course, since these open neighborhoods all lie inside here, that union must be all of this uh, uh, path component, and since this is then expressed as a union of open neighborhoods, it is itself open. Okay, so let's see how we're going to do that. It basically follows from the definition. Okay, how do we pick this n? Well, the first point to note is that this uh, path component of z is the same as the path component of x. You see, x is inside this path component, so of course the equivalence classes of this one and this one have to be the same. So this n just has to be inside the path component of x. So it just is uh, all the points inside here have to be path connected to x. Okay. So what we do is we just pick the n inside here. And all those points are path connected to x. And that's the open neighborhood that we need. Okay. This is just gives you a neighborhood. But of course, inside that neighborhood, you can find an open neighborhood. And of course, uh, that one will give you the one where it's uh, all the points are there path connected inside uh, x to this uh, x here okay and that shows this proposition any locally path connected space its path components are automatically open and now we can say precisely okay what the difference between path connectedness is and connectedness okay so path connectedness is a stronger condition and how much stronger is it well it turns out that we can characterize it as follows if x is both locally path connected and connected then it is path connected okay so we've saw before that if it's path connected, okay, then it is connected, and now we have a type of converse, but we have to add this extra condition, and we saw that we have to add something because of the swine curve example that we saw before, which was uh, not path connected, but it was connected, okay? So this swine curve is not locally path connected. So let's see why that's true, and we're going to use this theory of path components that we saw earlier, okay? So the first thing is that, of course, path components were defined via an equivalence relation, so this topological space X, you can write as a disjoint union of the path components. And now we see that, well, these path components in the locally path connected case, they're all open. So in fact, you have uh, expressed X as a disjoint union of these open sets, these uh, 
path components. Now we're assuming here that X is not just locally path connected, but connected, right? So of course you can't disconnect this space X by expressing this as a disjoint union of non-empty uh, open sets, okay? Of two different ones, okay? So in particular, we find that, well, how many path components can you have, okay? Well, they all must be empty except for one of them. In other words, you only have one path component, okay? And if you only have one path component, what does that mean? Of course, that means that any point is um, in the same path component as another, so that um, you can construct a path from one to the other, okay? So any two points are path connected, so the space itself is path connected. And that gives you the proof that if X is locally path connected and connected, then it is indeed path connected. Okay, so this is another way, uh, this notion of path connected is a different way of looking at the topological notion of connectivity. Okay, and it may seem fairly natural, but uh, as we can see, it's a little bit different. Okay, in my next video, I want to talk about another very, very important topological property, that of compactness.